It was my 60th birthday, May the 6th, last year, and on May the 5th at 9.50pm I was at my computer when I received a telepathic message to grab my large digital SLR camera, not my compact camera, and they told me to fix my large external flash gun on the top. And I think this enabled me for the light to go further into the field. They told me to go outside and start um, shooting the camera. And I did, and I got 15 images of these beams of light that were shooting out of the ground. Most people think that the UFO phenomenon, the UFO issue, is seeing lights in the sky, which can be explained as other things. Well, if you look at the information in this conference, you realise it's not just about that. On May the 7th, 10pm, uh, uh, I was on the computer again. And I was told again to do the same thing. The camera was now sitting ready on the kitchen top. I went straight outside and got another 45 images. And they were even coming through the balcony and when I was standing outside my front door, right by my feet. This is orbs. I mean, orbs are ten a penny these days, but I do do a lot of orb photography. And this was one I took in the garden of where I now live. But this was the shooting orbs. Now, when they were lightened in Photoshop, you could see at least a hundred in the, um, going further back into the field. Now, as, these, as I was um, snapping away, taking these images about every 10 seconds, I received a telepathic uh, message and they said to me, this is a consciousness in itself. And they said they were leaving the earth plane because the frequency was changing. Uh, I mean, I'm only just going to show you a few of these here. I don't know what was going on, but um, that was my balcony. That's a close-up view. Now, that was an interesting... There was this thing here. But when you enlarged it, there, that's what it looked like. I'm not too sure what that was. You see one going through the, uh, from, from, through the bank there. So there were 60 shots and every shot had something on it and it, it stopped instantly, it just shut down and it ended. But since taking these, um, I joked to my friend John, I said, oh, I've just been told I think I've gone away on holiday. Um, but the thing is, um, we don't get much at all now. It's, it's, really, it's really bizarre. Now, about three months before that, I was told again to take my camera outside and I just took my small compact. There was this swirling mist just by my steps as I was going down the steps, got into the garden. I took this shot and I thought this was a streak of light and there was an orb here. But when I took the next shot, about 15 seconds later, the light, that strange light was still there. And then when I took the next shot, the being on the front of my book, but it's too stylized that John done for me because when I, I've met this being a few times, I call them the tulip people because their head reminds me of a tulip, but on the front of my book, it goes off in two parts. There's three parts to the head, but there's not. There's two, and it slightly splits in the middle and goes back. And this was a third shot, and that is standing. I don't know if you can't, you can't see it on... No, you can never... Let me just bring up another one where I've tried to lighten it. You can sort of see it there where it's, thank you, where its legs are over the, um, over the uh, wire fence, that's the top of its head where it splits up into two parts, is its hand and its body. Now that's it close up. Bearing in mind I was told to go outside, that's where I put a blue filter on, you can sort of see it a bit more clearly. Here it is with the orb. And then the next shot I took, after this, I was... And that was the last shot. Now, was that the energy form of it shooting away? I don't know. Uh, this is a place known as the Lincolnshire Triangle, where we've had the, the, the wind turbine incident. We've, we've had 1,500 sheep go completely missing, and I am hoping to do a report on that. Uh, I've actually spoken to the detective in charge of this case. This is the biggest case of British animal rustling in, in history. 1,500 sheep completely disappeared, no tyre tracks, no evidence that the sheep even exited the field. Uh, the couple who lived next to the field slept right through it. The dog did not wake up. Uh, three people were arrested for it and um, they've been completely cleared. So no one knows how these sheep disappeared. Now, if once you factor into that, that this is a major UFO hotspot in the UK, you have to start looking at other explanations as to why these sheep have disappeared. And there are several other instances of, of this kind of phenomenon happening in the UK. 
the Alan Godfrey case of 1980 and uh, cases at Rib Ribston Farm in, in Wales. So that's a case that I'm looking into in, in, a, in an objective manner in the same way that a, a, de a detective would try and solve a crime because the detective in that case asked me what he thought my opinion of it was. He said, Richard, um, I'm really interested to know what your theory on how these sheep went missing were. This is the detective constable, sorry, detective sergeant uh, on this case in Lincoln. Um, yes. I was just wondering a bit about the uh, bit of technology you were interfacing with. Um, could you describe it a little bit? I mean, was it terrestrial? Was it back engineered? Or was it given to the NSA by a source unknown? Yeah. Um, uh, part of the problem with my, my experience is I just don't have a lot of answers. And unfortunately, I mean, I could, I could have made a great story if I'd had two or more answers, but I don't. Um, I, I, I believe, personally, I believe that it was um, alien-inspired technology built by the military in concert with the alien race um, because I wasn't connected to that computer at all. So it had to have had some sort of interface um, that allowed me to, to do that, and I don't think that's human technology. My impression of an alien is the exact same impression that yours is, and it's fed by the media and all the things that we see, you know, that people write about. And... No one's going to let off any nukes, because the ETs won't allow it. Well, I, I, I guess, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe the reports, but um, it's just up to interpretation, but I, I, I really can't speak to it, because I just don't know. Where were they situated in, in space? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I always, uh, and this came up in an interview yesterday about <clears throat> were, the, were the communications themselves electronic or um, electromagnetically based, you know, in our mind. Because uh, electromagneticism magnetic, um, travels at the speed of light. And if I were communicating with an alien race that was three, you know, three light years away or whatever, uh, that would be a long uh, conversation. <laughs> so I don't think it was based in that, and I don't think that they could or they had to necessarily be here. I think they could have been anywhere, and I don't. But I don't know where they were. Then I never got a location. Do you know the species of them? No, I, I don't know anything about species or anything like that. I'm not allowed to remote view the moon, and anybody here who thinks they landed on the moon with Apollo. I know actually you can put your hand up. So nobody in this room thinks you land, that we landed with, the, with Apollo missions. Okay? Very good uh, clip about that where they have a, 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 a cutout stuck on the window with the earth as a half crescent. And they zoomed out, you can see the bit they stuck on the window. Okay, the Amash project. More correctly pronounced, Amak, in a northern accent. It's anomalous mind management abductees and contactees. Uh, I've a member, been a member of before for a very long time, of a lot of time for before. I think they've done a hell of a lot of good work, but quite frankly, in the last 15 years, are full of crap. And they're abductees. Uh, they're, they're like a sponge and absorbing the information, keeping it and keeping it away from the public. Uh, and Matthew Williams gave me an interview some time ago where he describes in great detail that when they're actually making the crop circles, who the hell are those other guys? Black shadow entity beings involved with the people who fake the crop circles, which is why a lot of people in crop circle research, oh, don't go and talk to the circle makers. There's a much more to this than meets the eye, and the people who fake and make the crop circles, I know uh, Richard D. Hall's done a fantastic series of programs one of the programs was on crop circles, and he did a great deal of work on this. He's done a fantastic job. And one of them was the circle maker teams trained by MI5. This kind of psychic warfare has been completely militarized. Here we have a situation where um, the remote viewers working for the military, who with conjunction with ETs and non-humans, with connected computer networks and things, are actually going inside the soldiers in battle. 
So you have soldiers in battle with multiple objections, injections of nanotechnology and things. Um, also in the book you describe that you were given pills, of, which we don't know if they were some sort of cognitive enhancers, you were given pills at certain points when instructed to do so. Um, just out of interest, apart from those two things, do you think a normal person without those two sort of upgrades or, or helpers could do what you did if they had access to the same sort of biofeedback machine that you it's interesting getting questions from people who've read the book because they bring up things that I didn't talk about. Um, I don't think that it could get to that level without the genetic procedure, and if it could, they wouldn't have need to, needed to do it. So, and I don't think also, um, this is just my opinion, I don't think they could do, even with that, that gear or the, the equipment that I was using, I don't think they could do it without the genetic management part of it. Um, you, I, not, that's not to say that somebody couldn't do something in the realm of, of ESP or telepathy or some, something having to do with the mind, but not that particular thing that I did, I don't think. So for when the human nervous system and our collective culture is confronted by both psychedelics and interfacing with advanced ET cultures, um, it acts as a catalyst to language and thus consciousness. Again, it comes back to that whole idea we said at the start about we can't evolve faster than our language. If we can't name it, then it doesn't exist. Um, this buzzing that takes place when people are learning this new, this new mechanism of, uh, of sort of understanding. Um, so part of this evolution of the body where tones and visual communication then turn the nervous system into a higher bandwidth holographic receiver. Um, that's my idea of what's going on. It could be something totally different, um, but something tells me that there's, it's, it's, it's the, the whole change in, in, the, in the body and the soul that's actually going on here. On us, if we're sort of bioelectric beings, which is what we are primarily, before anything else we're electric systems, um, then it's possible that um, this DNA that we, we have hidden, this linguistic ability that's sort of perhaps hidden in, in those strands of DNA, um, could they be influenced by this change and shift from the sun? And this whole idea that when you look at the Mayan calendar, it's all to do with a blast from Mayan Galactic Central coming our way down to the planet um, as this galactic alignment takes place. You know, could it be that uh, for either all of us or some of us, then this energy that comes forward is going to switch on this ability, this latent ability that was there before at the time of uh, when Genesis was around, uh, when Genesis was being written about the account of the Tower of Babel, um, could it be that this, these sort of, this 2012 year is all about switching on these sort of factors? Or I was thinking perhaps more if we accept this part of our evolution and our genetics a bit more and we, we spread the word about this and become a bit more open to this ourselves and aren't as afraid of it, then maybe we'll have a more positive outcome to things. So that's me done. Thank you for that. started with a bang, big bang, who lit the fuse? Well, God, I suppose, there wouldn't have been anyone else around. Yeah, but what puzzles me is, where did he buy the matches? So I just want to finish with um, Ben. Uh, lighten your load. Enjoy life. Sleep soundly. Make time to play. Expect the unexpected. And that's where we all are somewhere. Thanks a lot for listening. We have faced possibly, Don Irwin is constantly warning that we are in imminent danger of a fake World War III event happening in London during the Olympics. Now the fact we know about that means it's distraction. It's all over the internet. So wake up and smell, and smell the coffee, guys. That's all I've got. Did you ever engage any sense of, I mean this in a very sincere way, did you engage any warmth or sense of humour or irony during your communication? I, I, I did see that, but <clears throat> it's like, um, it's like uh, when, you, when you have this jovial uncle that you're, that you're used to seeing and, and he's happy, a happy uncle, but he's not particularly happy that day, but you know he's a happy guy in general. That's the sense that I got. I, I sense the emotions around the communication. I sense that they were there, and they were, um, the potentiality for it was there, but our communications wasn't uh, uh, the type of communications that would solicit uh, an, uh, those types of emotions, so I didn't get that. I just got a very logical and structured communications because I would constantly be going through the day going, am I dreaming? 
No, no, I'm, this is real. Because the dreams were so real. That's why. And that, but that subsided over time, and it, it's not like that anymore. I just have kind of a normal dream. But I do have a very um, active dream um, life, I guess. Hi, Dan. I just wanted to ask, were you given any proof that you were communicating with an EBE and not, for example, your commanding officer? <laughs> yeah, I get that question a lot. Uh, no. Uh, no, the, 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 short, the short answer to that is no. Um, but I, I, I don't think the entire process and what they told me and the training and all that, I, I don't think they had any incentive to make me think that it was an alien as opposed to human because why not just bring the human in and just tell me I'm part of a human experiment? You know, I mean, so you have to look at things at face value sometimes and not try to second guess it to the nth degree. Because if you do that, then you just drive yourself crazy. But, you know, that's, you know, it's entirely possible. Just like I was mentioned over here, it's entirely possible. But I just don't seem to think so. And also because of the, um, some of the answers I got to my questions, I mean, they just, they were too unhuman. You know, non-human. Um, I'd really like to um, give uh, Anthony a little credit here. He's moved this, I guess, from Leeds, three years running, to Liverpool. And that is a testament to your community. So let's give him a, a round of applause. And, and to make sure that it stays in Liverpool, let's tell people and let's get, you know, let's get the community charged about it. I appreciate the invite, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.